Okay, so the next part of this lecture is about the computation of the DFT using the FFT algorithm. Although the FFT algorithm is covered in your theory course, I'll present a quick review here because it will be especially useful when we make reference to the hardware and software features of the DSP related to the efficient implementation of the FFT. Okay, so the computation of the endpoint DFT, as we know, involves the following expression as shown here. And it can be viewed as the sum of capital N products for an endpoint DFT. The coefficients involved in the product are called the twiddle factors. X of N are the input time domain samples. X of K are the DFT output values, which are typically complex values. If we consider the twiddle factors and this particular operation over here in general of the sum of n products, we see that we need n square multiply adds for an endpoint DFT. So we need capital N multiply adds for each output xk and then we have capital N values for xk. So which leads to this number n square for the number of computations required in all for an endpoint DFT. Okay, now the twiddle factors, it turns out, have some very special properties. They are periodic in the sense we see that for an eight point DFT, where the, of which the twiddle factors are shown over here uh, in the complex plane as the roots of unity, we have only eight unique values. And that too, within those eight unique values, is considerable symmetry in terms of the twiddle factors being related by complex conjugate symmetry or as positive negative versions of each other okay so this is how we can take advantage of that we can take the normal dft expression and decompose it into the following two sub sum of products one over the even samples of the time domain signal and another over the odd samples this can, by a substitution of variables, be reduced further into the following expression. Uh, and eventually, we have an expression which uh, gives us the value for x of k in terms of two sums of product, each of which is over capital N by two samples. And one of which involves the even samples of the input uh, signal and the other involves only the odd numbered samples of the input signal. Okay, so then we exploit another symmetry, one of the symmetry properties and uh, reduce the twiddle factor to a twiddle factor which corresponds more closely with that that would be used in a capital N by 2 DFT. And we have the following expression which looks more like individual, the combination of individual n by two point DFTs, one over the even index samples of the input signal and another over the odd index samples. Uh, so replacing the n by two DFT with a variable name over here, we see that x of k, the k DFT output sample can be obtained by uh, comparing, uh, combining two outputs one from one each from an n by two point dft uh, in the following manner so gk and h of k are each n by two point dfts and of course the index k goes all the way from zero to uh, capital n minus one and we know from the periodicity of the dft itself that we can actually from the same four points of gk or rather the same n by two points of gk we can repeat and get values of gk beyond n by 2. Okay, so here is a schematic that captures that last equation that we saw. Uh, it tells us that we can compute an n by 2 DFT from the even index samples and another n by 2 DFT from the odd index samples to get the two DFTs g of k and h of k. And then corresponding values from G and H can each be combined in pairs to produce one output sample each of the final DFT X of K. So we see that the 
combining of outputs, one from each of the NY2 DFDs to generate each sample of the final output, involves one multiplication. Okay, so let us now look more closely at a single basic unit of this stage, namely the two-point structure where we have two inputs and two outputs. So if you look at this more closely, we can see that this is can be depicted by the following uh, flow graph uh, where GI and HI are combined uh, via the multiplications used in this stage to generate two outputs of the succeeding stage. Uh, if we take these twiddle factors and combine them in terms of the symmetry that they exhibit, then it turns out that we can reduce this structure to this structure below, uh, which notably has only a single multiplication rather than two. And we also see that this basic uh, two-point combination that comes after the twiddle factor multiplication is nothing but a two-point DFT, right? It just involves one sum and one difference. Okay, so this tells us that actually the number of multiplies in going from one stage to the next is not even n, it's actually n by 2 because we just reduce these two multiplies to 1. Okay, so this basic structure, we'll find out it's really like the building block of a large uh, FFT uh, flow graph uh, and it has a special name, it's called a butterfly computation because of the shape of the flow graph. Okay, so let's just do some calculations, very simple calculations. So we will assume that we are talking about the number of multiplications only, since that is the really intensive uh, operation. So we have for a capital N size DFT, we have already seen that we have capital N square multiplications. Now when we reduce or do the decomposition that we just did into two N by two DFTs, then we have a total computation of twice as many multiplications as there are in an n by 2 DFT plus the capital N multiplications in going from one stage to the next. So we saw in the previous slide that this number can actually be n by 2 but then we are just doing some very cross uh, calculations here. So let's assume we need capital N multiplications by twiddle factors in going from one stage to the next. That is the stage of combining n by 2 uh, DFT outputs to get the NDFT outputs. Okay, so if you look at this number, you will find out that this number is actually less than capital N square. So we can try this out for a choice of N equal to 8 and you will see that whereas N square is 64, this particular calculation reduces to 40. Okay, now of course there is nothing stopping us from trying to achieve even more efficiency by decomposing the n by 2 DFTs further into n by 4 DFTs. So in that case, we would be replacing the computations for a single n by 2 DFT given by n by 2 square by the following number of computations, that is n by 2 for the number of multiplies going from one stage to the next. And of course, twice as many multiplications as required by a single n by 4 DFT. Continuing this way, we can see that if n is a power of 2, we can do this decomposition new times when u is given by log 2n. So that gives us a total computation as we will see more clearly when we look at the overall flow graph of capital N times log 2n. Now to get an idea of the extent of savings, we can look at this graph which shows us the number of operations both for the straightforward DFT by the green triangles as well as the number of operations in the style that we just computed for the capital N point FFT. So we see over here that at very small values of N there are savings like we just saw in the case of N equal to 8 but the savings at least on the scale uh, shown here uh, are really very small compared to the extent of savings in uh, computation that we see as capital N grows larger. Uh, so we have a huge uh, savings in overall computation at large N 
and that's a really strong motivation for using the FFT algorithm whenever we are required to compare co compute the TFT of a signal. Okay, so now we are finally ready to check out the overall flow graph of what is known as the Radix 2 FFT decimation in time algorithm uh, for reasons that will become apparent very soon. So we see here that we have the outputs of this 8 point uh, DFT at the very output stage. Uh, and these outputs are created by combining the outputs of the four point DFTs that are computed by a previous stage. Uh, the combination involves a series of two point butterflies and we can see the similar structure in the previous stage of the four point DFTs and going further back where the first stage comprises a series of uh, two point DFTs in the following manner. Uh, each stage is connected to the next one by the twiddle factors that are shown right here. Uh, so we notice that the input itself is in a rather a peculiar order and that's where the name comes from decimation in time uh, because we seem to have picked up uh, the time domain input samples in uh, by skipping samples uh, or by reordering the basic uh, time domain samples in a completely different order. Uh, this will make uh, you know we will begin to see the structure in this time domain uh, index reordering if we consider the following binary representation of the order that is used of the input samples so we were to represent each of these indices by the th three uh, size binary number then we would see we have the following order 0 0 0 for 4 we have 1 0 0 for 2 we have 0 1 0 and so on but this ordering is not so chaotic as it appears when we realize that if we read these very same numbers in the reverse order, they actually turn out to be the perfect order from lowest to highest. So we can go 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 and so on. So this has a special name. It's a very special addressing pattern and it has a name. It's called bit reversed addressing. Uh, so this is also something that can be made efficient by having a special, uh, you know, addressing uh, feature uh, for the computation of the FFT. Okay, so now we are ready to discuss next uh, what are what we call as fixed word length effects. As we have seen, any DSP algorithm uh, that is programmed on chip uh, and necessarily uses only finite word length representations for all of the variables. So we need to be concerned about the format that we use so that we do not in, uh, come across uh, instances of overflow uh, while at the same time uh, preserving the precision uh, to the best extent possible. So if you consider the DFT computation, we can see over here that it essentially uh, involves each output is the sum of n products. So it's like the sum of n other numbers. Uh, so we can see that the magnitude of the output can in principle be up to n times the maximum input value. So if that is the case, we know that even if the input uh, is uh, you know taken into consideration in designing the range of the fixed point format uh, that does not uh, prevent uh, the possibility of the output overflowing. So how do we avoid this? Uh, as we've learned that to avoid overflow we need to scale down uh, the input values. Uh, so we could of course scale down the input range itself by capital N to ensure that the output then does not overflow. Uh, on the other hand, we can do a bit better by realizing what that what we saw just now in the case of the entire uh, FFT flow graph here that the, uh, the output actually uh, is arrived at in a series of stages and in each stage the output or the intermediate output is obtained from the combination of only two previous values. 
So we see that if this is the case, the magnitude at each stage of the intermediate values actually grow at most by a factor of 2 across a butterfly. So instead of applying a scaling of 1 upon n to the input itself, we can actually achieve the similar scaling eventually, but by scaling the output of each stage by 1 half. So what do we achieve by this? We actually achieve intermediate uh, values uh, being stored at the highest precision we can get without applying a blanket 1 by n scaling right at the very input itself. So we are able to maintain a much better precision uh, as we do computations across the flow graphs. Okay, so we've gone through uh, some of the uh, you know kind of theoretical uh, considerations uh, in block based processing in general and for the fft algorithm uh, itself so what you're going to do next is look at the codes uh, that you actually would have written in the lab uh, with reference to some of the discussion that we just had in terms of how uh, the efficiencies uh, of the FFT algorithm are exploited on a DSP. Uh, so this uh, explanation will be given by Pulkit and Prashant, uh, DSP lab RAs. And then finally, we will show you a video of an application which exploits both FFT uh, as well as the DMA concepts uh, that we discussed in the course of the lecture here. And eventually, we'll give you some pointers to some more uh, you know, videos and material that you can look at yourself and, uh, you know, get uh, an enhanced understanding of uh, the application uh, of uh, DSP processors in uh, signal processing systems. Yeah, thank you.